Hello and welcome to another episode of Goddess of Crypto. I am so pleased today to have with me Jessica Levesque. She is the executive director of C4, which is a Canadian nonprofit that does education and certification for cryptocurrency. The sacred divine feminine is creative, abundant, flowing, receiving, and disruptive and the new energy of money, including cryptocurrency, decentralized finance, NFTs, and even the metaverse, is all these things too. Welcome to the Goddess of Crypto, a weekly show where women who are already in this powerful space will cover these topics simply, so you can relax into knowing that the future of finance is female. Jessica, I'm so happy to get to talk to you today. Yeah, hi, thank you. I'm glad to be here. I love talking anything about blockchain technology, cryptocurrency, and um, being a woman in this in this field. Well, and I suppose that's because you have such a strong technical background and a degree in technology, right? <laughs> Oh, yeah. No, false, opposite. In fact, it's an ongoing joke with the people I work with that for someone who understands how cryptocurrencies work so well, I'm terrible with technology. It's seriously an ongoing joke where I can't I'm just major like minor little things that you think wouldn't be a problem. I'm like, I don't get it. So I always say if I can learn how cryptocurrencies work on a high level and I've gotten even a little bit deeper than that, anybody can really. My background is in English. It's an English major. <laughs> so, like, so if there's ever any gramma- grammar problems in the code, you're, you're the girl to go yeah, to. That's right? about it. That's funny. So, um, so what is your background in English? Like, how did you go from that to this? Like, how, tell, tell us about that journey. Yeah, so I love language and literature, and that's always been something that I've just found fascinating. And then I went to college for it. And then I also had a communication studies degree. Afterwards, I got my master's again in English because I'm one of those people that wants to open a really big, smelly old book and just fall into the story and not notice anything else around me. And so that's been my dream. Are you a big reader? Oh, gosh, yes. Yeah, 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 yes. Um, so I love the, I love fiction. I love joining somebody else's world. It's so fun. Mm. Um, but so did that after grad school, I decided to teach. It's kind of what I always wanted to do. I was a college professor. I worked in general education. So I taught communication studies and English and then moved up into administration. And I was this, my last position in higher ed was as an associate dean at city colleges of Chicago. And so it was nothing to do with technology. Again, I was the associate dean of a adult education program, and we did work with GED and ELL students. So total curveball. If you had told me eight years ago, this is what I'd be doing, I'd be like, oh, I don't know what you're saying. <laughs> what is that? Mean? <laughs> so definitely um, wasn't like a straight trajectory, which I think is what makes it so fun. Oh, that's so great. So what was the shift? Like what happened after that? Yeah. So I was working, um, you know, going into the office every day. I loved students. I missed teaching, but I loved being in that college environment and then started to want to, I was still interested in education, wanted to make a shift. And my friend, Pamela Morgan, who has been working in the Bitcoin and open blockchain space since 2014, 2013. Mm. She, I'd always heard her talking about it. And then in 2017, I finally started listening and reading and listening and really absorbing. And then I fell in love and I haven't left since. So I don't know. I always say, if I can do it, you can do it. Like anybody that's listening, if you're interested in this, start small, look at some of the you know, basic information and let it pile up bigger and bigger. Because if you dive in all at once, it can feel overwhelming. overwhelming. At least it did for me. 
but just yeah. like little bits and pieces. And then some people fall in love with it and some people don't. And if it's not something that just catches your attention, I personally think stick with it. It's like sometimes those really big books that at first are a struggle to get into, but then once you become absorbed, it's so worth it. Um, but really to each their own. Either way, I think just having financial literacy is super important. Mm, yeah. And um, my, certainly I, my experience is that a lot of women don't have financial literacy because we didn't get it in school. I mean, you know, when I was in school, it was like, you know, home ec and wood shop, but you know, they were explaining to you like, you know, how to, how to make a recipe, not how to balance a checkbook. And these days, like we don't even have checkbooks. So it's really changed significantly. Um, what do you think about how, I guess, how financial literacy and crypto or being in the environment of this new version of the web that is called Web3, what do you think um, those two things are, how do you think they're, they're connected, financial literacy and, and those new, you know, new fields? Well, I think basic financial literacy, which is really at the basic level, just understanding how to exchange currency for goods or services. I think just at the basic level, there's actually a lot of similarity. We don't know the intricacies necessarily of traditional banking systems, and we don't have to in order to go into Gap and pick out a sweatshirt and go through the checkout and buy it. We just need to understand that we have money, that it exists, what it does, how much the exchange rate is. You know, you, you need to know that if you have $5, you probably won't be able to buy a new parka, something like that. We have this idea. And then we go into these stores, we do the transaction and we leave. And I think part of it, the reason that cryptocurrencies seem maybe scary to some people or like this big leap into this other financial world is because we haven't seen those transactions growing up and throughout our life the way that we do see going to a store with a parent and making you know, buying that sweatshirt and seeing what that looks like. If we grew up watching somebody use a cryptocurrency wallet, it wouldn't seem as scary. Absolutely. Yeah. I, you know, um, I was in the audience at the Bitcoin conference when Jack Mahler of Strike uh, made the announcement that they had done all of these different deals, which would enable point to point uh, transactions. They're going to take um, the, you know, like you could put up your, your wallet, like an uh, Apple pay is the closest thing that we've seen to this. And it would instantly transfer whatever currency you have into Bitcoin, transfer it over the lightning network, which is the network that does this work. And then, and the moment of it hitting the merchant, uh, it would re change over into the merchant's currency. So you could put in your dollars and the merchant could get euros and that would still happen almost instantaneously. And it would cost a few what's called, uh, I know you know this, but for the audience, what's called a, um, a sat or a satoshi, which is a, the smallest unit of, of a Bitcoin, which is one, one millionth of a Bitcoin is called a satoshi after the um, pseudonymous founder Satoshi Nakamoto of Bitcoin. So it was really beautiful to watch, but basically what he talked about was the idea that none of this stuff's really changed since the 1940s. So starting in the 1940s, we got to see these transactions happening and we were like, uh, you know, your parents did it, their parents did it. And now all of a sudden there's a new paradigm coming up. So you're absolutely right. It, we don't, we take for granted that process. We're not saying I don't understand like, wait, how does the merchant take three and a half percent? And why does it take three days? We don't ask those questions. But the truth is that it obviously doesn't have to work like that because it's going to cost less than a penny to do this kind of transaction. And instead of the merchant waiting, you know, up to a week for their funds, they're going to get it in like five seconds. So, yeah. hey, paradigm shift. And, and to me, that's, you know, that's worth like getting a little bit educated on so that you don't have to be scared of something that's going to save you time, save you money, and, you know, maybe make your cost of goods lower. Yeah. I think one of the things you just said that I want to touch on a little bit is the idea of having a Satoshi and it being part of a Bitcoin. So we hear the phrase like pennies on the dollar. So we know when we say pennies, what that means, when we say dollar that we know what that means. There's a misconception among people who haven't kind of dove into cryptocurrencies or learned about Bitcoin yet, which it makes sense why, but there's a belief that 
you need to own an entire Bitcoin to be in Bitcoin. And so then there's that conversation about the price and people say, I don't know what's that right now, but let's say it's at 20,000 people will say, oh, I don't have $20,000, so I can't own Bitcoin. But it's important to recognize that you can own a fraction of a Bitcoin. And I actually have a t-shirt, I should have worn it, that says you can own a fraction of a Bitcoin. Um, and you can. And so you can start with really small amounts like Satoshi, uh, like Satoshis and have a few of them. And it doesn't need to be this huge, colossal amount of money that you put into it. You can start small, which I think we all should anyways, when we're learning something new and learn how to make transactions, which is the same thing with traditional currency, buy something, you give your money, you get the good back. It's the same thing. You buy something, you pass over a portion of Bitcoin, and then you your wallet receives the, the, the change in there. I'm not going to go into the details of that, but it it's the same system, basically. It's just different terminology. And there are different, I would say, interfaces, which are actually better now. If you go on a Bitcoin wallet and you look at a Bitcoin wallet interface, so like if you pull up your phone and you look at what it looks like on there, you most likely be somewhat familiar with how it's designed because the UX has improved. So it looks similar to when you open up your banking app or when you open up Venmo. And that evens the playing field a lot, I think, when you see it. And oh, okay, it says exactly what the dollar amount is. I know how to send this here and there. And practice, nothing's easy. That first time you went in with your parent and bought that sweatshirt or whatever, you were probably nervous. <laughs> I actually remember going in with my dad's credit card. That's what, that's how long ago I got to do this. I had like a little letter and it was like, my daughter is allowed to charge. And the, the, I went into, a, and it was a gap actually, it's like the Levi's store or whatever. And they were probably predated the gap and they were like, Oh, okay. A little girl. And then I was able to pick up my first pair of jeans. I was so proud. That's so funny. I forgot all about being able to use your parents' credit card and have a note. I've done that too which now if somebody brought a note like yeah right <laughs> I <could> try. <laughs> get the hell out of here um so uh so all right so we've talked about the idea of a transaction and then the idea of yes making bitcoin divisible um yeah I, for me a couple of things come up from what you just said first of all i uh, do dollar cost averaging so i buy bitcoin every friday and that means that I'm, I'm not concerned about the immediate price. I am buying over the long term and I will end up with an average price. Bitcoin, I was buying Bitcoin at $68,000. I'm buying Bitcoin at $20,000. I think Bitcoin's going to have a hard summer. I'll be buying Bitcoin at $14,000 or whatever it ends up going down to. Um, I just saw a, um, a post this morning from 2013 Mount Gox is crashing. Bitcoin is below a dollar. And somebody else wrote back, buy, buy, buy. So, you know, there was a time that I don't think Bitcoin, people are like, Bitcoin's going to zero. I'm like, you don't understand how it works. But it's, you know, it definitely can go down and we are seeing like extreme volatility. But I think that it's a question of like, as you go forward, getting educated on the concept of Bitcoin. And one of the things that I'm seeing, this is so funny, I see people deal with this all the time. The idea that Bitcoin isn't physical is very hard for people. And I actually have in my bag physical Bitcoin souvenirs that I bought for like a dollar a piece off of Amazon. And when I meet somebody and I do what's called orange pilling them. So I tell them about Bitcoin and they seem receptive to it. I give them a Bitcoin souvenir. And it's weird because the same thing happened to me when somebody did this to me. It's like you get it in your hand and it all of a sudden seems more real, even though there's no actual currency involved. So I want to talk about like your education program, the platform that you have that you do certification for. Does it address stuff like at that level or is it for programmers or, you know, how does that work? Oh, it's definitely at that level. Um, we do talk about the history of money and the functions of currency and um, really explain how we got to where we are today because it didn't just, Bitcoin didn't just appear. There's a long history that brought us to this point and both in previous digital assets, but also we're already doing this with traditional currency, whether we want to believe it or not. 
in, um, you know, it's a wonderful life. Everyone goes into the bank to get their funds out. And George Bailey says- Tell the story all the time. Oh my goodness. Okay, yes, keep going. I do too, go ahead. And so you go, (laughs) they all go in, they want their funds, but they can't get it because, and as George explains, your money is in that person's house and that person's house is whatever. Um, And so that's the same thing that we're doing right now. And I like to compare that to, because I'm a huge Harry Potter geek, Um, the, are you? (laughs) Okay. So like the opposite of what we think or what we see in Harry Potter is true. So in Harry Potter, Harry goes to Gringotts and opens the vault and all of the coins and all, everything is in there. Well, that's not true. You can't go to the bank and say like, Hey, I want to open my vault and get everything out. There isn't some small little box that has everything in it for us. It's all online. Literally. This is my my cold ingot from Gringotts. Oh my God, it's got I love the it. Harry Potter logo. My office is full of Harry Potter stuff. We will talk about that in a minute. Please finish your analysis. Oh no, now, I, now I'm already thinking, if you've been to Harry Potter World, did you get a wand? And what wand did you get? We'll discuss in a moment. I will show you my wand. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> love it. Oh, that's hilarious. I don't so, even know what so I was you're, talking about. You, yeah, you I were saying you go into the vault and Harry can access all of his money because it's all sitting there. And if you go through the right goblin and then you go on the big old roller coaster, you can get to your vault. But the truth is that our money is being, especially, I don't know, what's the percentage in Canada where you the banks have to keep, what multiple of your money do the banks have to keep in the bank in order to loan against it? Because in the United States, it's gone to zero. Yeah, I'm not sure. I live in the U.S. We're a Canadian nonprofit, but I am in the oh, U.S., so I, I'm not sure. Right, right. Well, okay, good question. so um, we know for a fact, though, that in the U.S., you used mm-hmm. to have to keep 100%. Like, if you wanted to loan out a dollar, you had to have a dollar in the bank. Then it was 50 cents. Then it was like 25 cents. And then in this last year, I think year to two years, it has gone to zero. So um, it's really embarrassing that, in fact, you, it's not only that it's gone to zero, it's you can loan out multiples of the money that you have on paper without keeping any in the bank. So imagine that, like, if I want to give Jessica $5 right now, I have to have the $5 to loan to Jessica. But if I'm in, if I'm in banking, Jessica could give me her $5. I could give it to somebody else. I could give them 25 more dollars. Let's just say they're very, very non forthcoming about the multiple, but I could maybe loan out another 25 bucks on top of Jessica's original five. And mm-hmm. then when Jessica comes to me to ask me for my, her $5 back, I can be like, okay, because I've got somebody else's $5, I can turn around and give to Jessica. That's gross, but that's the way the banking system works. Right, and to make a profit off it on top of it um, as well for loaning it out for sure. Yeah, but so there isn't that money sitting in traditional banks anyways, and it is all digital right now. Anyhow, pretty much. Very few people use cash or only accept cash anymore. So this is already happening. The difference in that I think is most important to be aware of is that the government controls traditional currency. They get to decide what is valuable, how we're going to be able to use it, what it can be spent on, will it be tracked? There's so many different rules, regulations, laws that force us to abide by them and follow all of the rules. With Bitcoin, there is not this higher power, this authority figure that's determining where and how the currency should exist. It's decentralized. If there wants, if people who are a part of Bitcoin want to make a change, they can vote. And I'm simplifying this, but basically they can go in and vote and say that they want things to be different one way or another, and things can change if the majority wants to make that change. So there's not this like patriarchal figurehead up there that's saying, yes, no, yes, no. There's a lot of different people involved that get to make these decisions. And that 
decentralization and consensus is really cool. It's really different than what we use now. And as a woman, um, you might relate to this and being in some ways the underdog in many situations and feeling like you need to kind of be, get scrappy to make your, make your way in the world. It's nice to have this alternative that doesn't function as just another like traditional aspect of patriarchal you know, systems. Yep. Yeah. You know, I hear from people all the time. They're like, well, who controls Bitcoin? I say nobody. Well, how is that safe? I'm like, no, no. How is it safe to have somebody else control your money? I just am in the middle. I'm probably going to do a separate episode about this because it was just so powerful, but I'm in the middle of reading the hair with amber eyes, um, which is a story about um, these Japanese objects de art called Natsuki that came from a very wealthy family during the time of the Impressionists, a Jewish family, and came down and were inherited generation after generation. And actually, these little objects were the only things in the family's collection that were saved from the Nazis. And so the guy that goes back in like the last 10 years or whatever and, and begins to research um, the history of them and uncovers through these objects his entire family's history. He also uncovers the like really specific path that people uh, the, that the Nazis took to destroy families of wealth. Now, in particular, Jews, but it was only because the Jews had that money that if they really wanted everybody's money and they would take it away from anybody that they could, could get. It was just that a lot of the, the people were Jewish. And so um, when, when somebody has that kind of control where like one day you have a fortune in seven countries and the next day you are penniless, that's really bad. The idea that, you know, I call Bitcoin a Pandora's box. And I say to people that say to me, like, Bitcoin's going to go to zero or that say that Bitcoin is, um, you know, is, is not worth it or that there's like something wrong with it or that it's, you know, it's, it's not OK because it isn't fiat. Like Bitcoin isn't backed by anything. I'm like, do you understand that the U.S. dollar is not backed by anything? That's right. the, like we have these beliefs like you were talking about earlier about the bank. A bank is supposed to be safe because I put my money in it. But if my money isn't in the bank anymore, like I'm, I'm, my mindset is an illusion. And that's true about gatekeepers. It's true about the money that's there. It's true about the fiat currency at all. Um, we've printed 80%. Now I've gotten like hard statistics on that. 80% of all the currency in circulation in the U.S. was printed in the last two years the mind boggles, right? So what we believe is like, you know, it's, it's no different from, you know, women being told, marry a rich man, your husband will take care of you. Like, that's crap too. I mean, he could, but it's crap that that's how you get your money or that's crap that you can't make money on your own. But we have been told these stories that are designed to like keep us safe. And really they're just kind of a house of cards. So- mm -hmm. Yeah, I, one of the things you said made me think of what we often say at C4, which is education, not speculation. There's no way to, we, no one has a crystal ball. We don't know what's going to happen with any currency. We've seen many different fiat currencies be devalued overnight. It's happened many times. And so we can't necessarily trust in that. But if you educate yourself rather than speculate about the markets and the volatility and whatnot, you can use that education to have a firmer footing on your personal finances and feel less frightened that you don't have these resources in order to um, protect yourself, basically. And I think there's something to Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies that aren't in that it's not kept in a traditional bank account and that people that are able to get it can securely use it in a way that they can take it with them and they can't, somebody else wouldn't have control over it. And um, in some relationships and in, you know, certain places, people don't have control over their money because somebody else takes it or does whatever they want with it, or they've got the controlling partner, whatever, having something that 
you have control over that no one else can access. They can't just go and put their name on it or they can't rifle through your drawers and find out your you know, checkbook. If you do, if you have the tools, those skills and can do it in a safe way, it can, I believe, and I'm a totally an idealist, but I think that it can change lives. It is, and it can change the world, really. If we educate enough people that it becomes adopted and is something that is not like this challenging, scary thing, but more like this really helpful, powerful tool, then we're going to be able to change the world. I love that. I, I mean, I think we've seen with how fast money got to Ukraine and how fast money was able to be distributed in Ukraine. And then other countries, you know, Cuba, uh, my family here in Miami is all Cuban and and because uh, my partner is Cuban and there's, um, you know, they're in a terribly dire situation. Like things have gone from bad to worse. In the 80s, they called it the special period. And that was the period where people literally had to fry shoe leather because they had nothing else. And they say that this is worse than the special period. And so when you hear stuff like that, it's very abstract. But for us to send money to Cuba is very, very difficult. And you know, under the Trump administration, they limited, severely curtailed the amount of fiat currency that was allowed to be sent. And then you're limited to stuff like, oh, you can send it through Western Union. Like, that's it, because it's very hard to get money in and out. Well, now with crypto, I mean, if somebody has a wallet in Cuba and somebody has a wallet in the U.S. or anywhere in the world, they actually can transfer the money instantly and it goes into that person's wallet immediately. And mm -hmm. that alone is a game changer. I think that that's so, and, and also cost practically nothing is instantaneous. I mean, that's such a big deal. Yeah. And I think one of the challenges to getting to this point where so many people are able to use it, that it's not this sort of like foreign weird word where, you know, still like my mom's like, what are you doing? What do you do for work? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and to get to the point where it's like, yeah, I work with cryptocurrencies and people are like, oh, okay. And aren't thinking like, oh, so you're a criminal then. Right. Like, right. This right. This weird thing. It's like, was or I a criminal a before? Yeah. <laughs> Have you met me? <laughs> yeah. Could I be a spy? <laughs> like, <laughs> um, but so one of the things that we're doing at C4 right now is, so I talked a little bit about how our, like our certified Bitcoin Bitcoin professional, we've got an exam, but we also have a prep course that explains and it starts really from the history of money and goes through how we got to digital assets. It breaks it all down. But one of the things that we have realized is that there is a gap and this is something that we want to fix. We started a new committee that we're going to be talking about practical crypto, basically, like how do you really use it? What do you need to know to get a wallet? And how do you know who to trust to do this? Hint, don't trust anyone. Um, always yeah. do lots and lots of research. So just because I'm talking and I'm from a nonprofit, like don't consider that you can necessarily trust me. I said this about everyone. Always look into what people are saying. Um, make comparisons. If you're recommended one wallet, check for, you know, check it online in different places and just make sure be you know, be as informed as you can. But so what we're doing is we're, we've created this committee so that we can create educational materials that are much more practical for using it because there is confusion still, rightly so, on how to make a transaction on the Bitcoin network. And one of the important things with this is making sure that people understand the difference between um, blockchains because there's more than one blockchain and you can't send money on the Bitcoin between blockchain them. that yeah. is ether. Like there, yeah, there you need to, there's a bunch of different workarounds for that, but it's not something that just, I think for most of us just makes sense right away. There's a lot of different factors. So we're working on creating these educational materials using crypto a little bit easier. And there are some good resources out there already, but I don't think there are enough. And I think we, our committee, the people that are volunteering are going to be able to really help move some of the, um, move some of the people who are unsure how to transact with crypto into the space where they feel much more comfortable. Oh, that's so important. Now, I, this is the one bugaboo that I have. So maybe you can help solve this for me. 
I have a really hard time going into a restaurant to buy a burger and fries with what I know is an appreciating asset. It may depreciate before it appreciates, but I know that over time in 10 years or whatever, that Bitcoin is going to be worth a lot more. Now, again, just like Jessica said, don't be taking my word for it. Get out there, do your own research, you make your own decisions. But for me, that is my reality. Okay. So how do I go? It's like taking money that is earning compound interest out of my savings account and and spending it. I don't want to do that either. So what do you, you know, what's your opinion on all of that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's definitely a challenge as it's become something that has been, I wouldn't say proven, but statistically shown that it is increased. Thing, and that's not something that's up for debate. So in terms of the numbers, it has proven to be a good investment if you hold it over time. Um, I guess the same could be true for, you know, like the American dollar, it keeps going down what you what you could buy for $5 last year, you can't now. Um, so do you just want to spend all of that? I don't I mean, I don't know, I wouldn't say that I'm a have good investment advice at all. Um, but I would say that if we continue to only use it as an investment, then it will never be a medium of exchange the way I think many of us want it to be. And so I think the first step is just education, getting people to the point where they understand how to use it. And you don't have to have that much of it to be able to use it. Um, that I think is important. You also don't have to start with something like Bitcoin. There are other cryptocurrencies that you can use to learn how some of this works. And I think that's the first step. And then once more people are educated, it doesn't seem as scary. And you were talking earlier about payment processors and how you can see something that's priced in you know, US dollars, and then your wallet can tell you how much Bitcoin it is, and then you can send it, even though there might be a slight shift in it, your wallet does the work for you, the place that you're buying something at can price it in your fiat currency and US dollars or whatever. And then you can you know what you're getting. The issue is I don't think enough people know or are comfortable using crypto or payment processors to actually accept crypto at their businesses. That's the biggest problem. Um, there's a sushi restaurant. My friend and I were super excited, accepted Bitcoin. And then we we didn't have any wallets with us when we went the first time. So we're like, we're going to go back. This is going to be awesome. And then they didn't accept it anymore. And I was like, oh my God, could, I, could we have prevented them from stopping? I mean, they no longer accepted it. So if we'd paid before, would they have continued to keep that as an option? Um, but I do think that we need to get the tools into the like mom and pop shops so that they can start to accept it and into some of the bigger retailers. And then once that happens, it will be more usable as long as people have the, the tools in order to safely transact, which I don't think a lot of people do right now. Um, and I mean, there are a lot of people, but in you know the grand scheme of things, if we talk about the whole world, the number of people who actually are familiar and comfortable using this is, is quite minimal. Yeah, so far. But I mean, I, you know, I always use the statistics and look at the graphs of internet adoption. And we're basically at like 1995 and 14 million people had started using the internet. And I was one of them, but um, with my own non-techie background, but it was still like, like we were super, super early. And about five years later, it really felt like it, it became you know, more mass adopted. You know, it's funny because I don't know the statistic, but I know that women are doing the majority of shopping. And so I feel like it's up to us women to get more educated about what these transactions are like and what the processes are like. Um, because that will, again, enable you to understand how easy that transaction is. I do compare it. I get asked this question on TV a bunch, and I compare it to Apple Pay all the time. Because when you take your phone and you stick it over your computer and it dings based on you know your face ID or whatever, stick a fork in us, we're done, right? So that's really helpful to people um, because they are able to... Um, to have a very simple, very transparent transaction. 
by the way, going back to what you said earlier, you don't know how Apple Pay works and yet you use it, right? <laughs> so we just trust the Apple network isn't going to screw us over or your Google Pay network or whatever. So um, that's the same thing with, with uh, Bitcoin or with any crypto transaction. And you were saying earlier, like you could use a different currency. And I know that like Shiba Inu, which is worth like a tiny, tiny fraction of a penny per a coin or, or per uh per token, I think, because it's, it, I don't know that SHIB has its own blockchain, but um, they, uh, they're accepted by like AMC, for example. And uh, so you can go into the theater and you can buy your movie ticket using your SHIB. And, um, you know, it may be worth less coming out of the movie theater than it was going into the movie theater, but that's okay too. So I think you're absolutely right. Like we want to have that kind of transactional experience um, and not mm -hmm. just you know, keep the money all saved up. And if you do keep your Bitcoin saved, then there are other things that you can use to transact because most of the time if they take Bitcoin, they're also taking like Ether and maybe a couple of other ones. Speaking of which, do you know the story behind Cardano and why the coin for Cardano is called ADA? I don't think so. <gasps> I have a story for the English major. I'm so excited. All right, so get this. Henry Lord Byron's daughter was Ada Lovelace, okay. and okay. she is the first woman, you got the light bulb just came on. She was the first woman to create a, a, a um, code designed to be read by a machine. So they actually say she's the precursor to the first programmer. So it was very exciting that that was a woman. And I actually bought like full disclosure, I bought Cardano when I heard the story. I was like, yeah, I'm putting my, I'm putting some money into these people right now because I was so excited about ADA being given tribute to. So I used to say ADA, but it isn't ADA. It is literally ADA because it's named after a person and not, a, it's not an acronym or anything. That is and I, love, uh, I didn't know I that love that's the, where it came from. That's very cool. Right. I didn't make And I actually, yeah. I got educated on the Cardano blockchain and, and, you know, sat in on a couple of Cardano, like, I don't know, a, a, they do the AMAs, the ask me anything. And I was just blown away, like by all the projects that are being built on Cardano. This is not financial advice. Do your own research, everybody for what Jessica says and what Hallie says. Always. So yes, always. So uh, one last thing, and then I will show you my Harry Potter wand because it's so beautiful. But what, what do you want women to know about getting into this field for work or getting into this field for investment? What do you want women to know? I would say if you are interested, reach out to other women and ask for help. There are so many of us that really care and really are passionate about this and, you know, are on Twitter at like 10 PM and would love to chat. <laughs> or 2 AM. Yes. <laughs> so there, yeah, exactly. There are so many people out there, so many women out there who are already, who already have this education. And I think that we're, most of us, I would say are accepting of saying, of acknowledging when we don't understand something and are okay with somebody else saying they don't understand something. So if someone comes to me and is like, Hey, I heard about this, like BitCan, what is that? I'd be like, Oh, well, you know, it's actually Bitcoin and whatever. And like, maybe we'll laugh at whatever BitCan is, but I'm not going to be like, you know, idiot. Like, you know, I say stupid stuff all the time, probably, <laughs> probably a lot. But the point is, is there are people around that want to help and, um, there are so many women who are willing to do that introduction and help explain things. And also there are a lot of um, female books like Anita Posh has a great book about learn earn Bitcoin that explains so many of the basics of it. Pamela Morgan has a crypto asset inheritance planning book. There are a lot of women that are already knowledgeable about this that I'm sure, I mean, I'm one of them that would sure be, would love to talk more about it and expand people's understanding of how it works. And like, we're not criminals. <laughs> <laughs> or spies. Um, so I, real quick, you mentioned um, that you are a mental health advocate. Just talk a little bit about that. I know it's off topic, but I, I, I would love everyone uh, who's listening to know about it. Yeah. So one of my passions is destigmatizing mental illness and also making mental health a priority in any 
friendship, relationship, work environment. It's something that at C4 we practice. It's really important that we're all open with if we're having a, a rough day, I suffer from anxiety. And I think it's important to be able to say to my team, I'm really anxious or, you know, I didn't sleep well last night because of whatever and have that. We're, we're mostly a team of women, although we have um, a lot of volunteers that aren't as well. But to have those conversations and to be open and honest about it, it creates Creates, being vulnerable creates these connections and it allows us the space to sort of breathe as ourselves in a way that's mm -hmm. so important to be able to say like, I can't make this meeting because of X, Y, Z. It doesn't mean you're a bad worker. I mean, I will say our team gets stuff done. We are amazing, but we're also humans. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that. And I have a Twitter site called Otterly Hopeful. And basically it's all about like loving yourself, taking care of yourself, putting yourself first, self-care isn't selfish, all that kind of a thing. And I do think that there is a crossover with crypto in terms of having that freedom once you understand a different financial system and you have that financial sovereignty. And there's also the connection of people who with the, the up and downs with volatility and needing to make sure you're doing those mental health checks that you're not obsessing over the price you're on your phone nonstop and putting it away. And I get that my opinion on this comes from a place of privilege in that if Bitcoin goes up or down, I'm still going to be able to pay my rent right now. I get that that's different for some people, but there are a lot of people that are just in it for investing and they're obsessing. They're on their phone. They're checking the price. They've got it like, you know, in front of them on this big screen all day. And it's, I would say, cut it out. Do like what you were saying with um, dollar price averaging. What's the phrase? Dollar cost averaging, DCA. Dollar cost yeah. averaging. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so to do something like that rather than become absorbed in it, because anything be can become an addiction basically and just mm -hmm. take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there were so many people when Luna uh, crashed, uh, there were a bunch of people who committed suicide and it's heartbreaking, but you know, there were people jumping out of buildings in 1929 when Wall Street crashed. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, after 9-11, when the market crashed so badly. And yep, we see that a lot. All right. I am going to show you in the two minutes that we have left. I'm going to go get my Harry Potter wand. And meanwhile, I want to discuss houses. I'm guessing you're Ravenclaw. Am I wrong about that? Oh, I can't. Rem well, I I think I always wanted to be Gryffindor just because, you know, everybody Potter. does. Um, right. Yes. But I don't know where I would actually be put. You have never done the sorting? I did a long time ago, like the sorting hat, um, yeah. Wizarding World app. I did a long time. Yeah. I, I don't remember what I got. Okay, um, well, I'm thinking Ravenclaw, but I could be it. wrong. Yes, I'm a Hufflepuff which is basically the golden retriever of the Harry Potter world where you're like super loyal and you're a really good friend. And I have to say, when I first got into the houses, I was like, I also, everybody I know wanted to be like, you know, in Gryffindor because of Harry Potter. And I was like, there must be some mistake. My girlfriend, of course, is a Gryffindor. I was, there must be some mistake. But I, I've taken the test multiple times and I'm always a Hufflepuff. And now I am a proud puff because I've learned that it is like, so, like from a mindset perspective, I could actually teach an entire course based on sorting people into the houses and based on the values of each house. And it's so spot on. So now if I find out that somebody is, you know, a Ravenclaw or a Slytherin or whatever, I'm like, oh, I know you. And it's really interesting because it's pretty accurate. And I think ultimately it's accurate about me, even though I now got a badger for a mascot. <laughs> anyway, this is my this is my Deathly Hallows wand stand and my wand. And I do not have anyone's wand. I went to Ollivander's and was sorted. I mean, got my wand from a, a man who was very, took his job very seriously and was extremely like a really good actor. And there was something that he happened. He wasn't an like, actor. He's a wizard. Come on now. Right? What yes. There was, there was something that happened to me in the middle of that where I like, I had like a moment. It was so bizarre. But I was like, I am a grown ass woman and I'm almost in tears over this piece of plastic and I do not care. And it was so beautiful. And then there's this 
glass tip to it. And when you walk around Wizarding World, you have to like, you see this um, a brass thing on the ground that tells you like, you know, so you go like Aguamente or whatever, and then you have to move your wand in a particular way and it starts to rain in front of you. And there are like 12 spells like that around Wizarding World that are tapped into the fact that this glass tip has, I don't know what in it. But anyway, let's just I have say- one too. It, and I did the same thing when I went. I have several Snapes. And my sister has Luna Lovegood. And we were running nice. around like this was like five years ago, running around the park with our wands. It was just so much fun. Um, we also, my family's really into Lego and we have the Harry Potter, Diagon Alley, the castle. This is like, we'll all of us grown adults pool together instead of buying Christmas gifts and we'll buy a Lego set and then we'll all do it together. And so we've decided my sister has to keep them at her house because she has a child. And when we started this, she, I think, was just pregnant but we're like no no she's gonna want it and so now we have like all of these different lego sets that are harry potter that we have to keep at our house because we're just we're sure that her daughter who is just like i don't know 14 months old <laughs> is gonna just love it <laughs> oh my goodness well I, you know i know that harry potter has affected a lot of people and for me it's about like you know staying connected with your childhood staying connected with joy staying connected with the idea of being, you know, magical, I think it's so much more interesting, the idea of being magical. And, you know, you were talking before about mental health advocacy. And, you know, I think so many of us feel a little bit special or a little bit extra or a little bit, you know, whatever that makes us feel not normal. And almost everybody feels not normal. So the idea that there is another path that you could take where you would be welcomed and appreciated for your not being normal, I think is really powerful. And I think at a time that, you know, we're being asked by our Supreme Court to be, you know, walk a particular narrow path, especially as women, um, it's really nice to have outlets where we can be like fully ourselves and, and, and not be told what to do by the patriarchy. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. I love that. I love the term normals. I, I'll say to my mom whenever she's like, you're being so weird. I'll say, you know, you had kids with dad. Why would you expect that you would have a normal? Like, of course I'm not a normal. Dad wasn't, <laughs> wasn't a normal. Right, and so right. like, I love non-normals. I don't know. I think that the world would be pretty boring if we were all that traditional straight lace didn't. And I don't really think anyone's like that. I think everyone's quirky in their own way. They might just not feel comfortable sharing that with others. But I, I find it hard to believe that there's anyone that isn't at least a little bit weird or has like some kind of, you know, magical wonderment about them in some way. I love that. Yeah. In crypto, they say you're not, you're a normie or you're like a crypto person. So crypto people will say like, oh, I had dinner last night with the normies. And it's because you can't talk crypto to those people because they don't understand it. So there's like a whole like idea of people like speaking your language or not speaking your language. And, you know, whatever works for you, as long as you're happy, I think is, is the right way. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah. It's all about finding your truth and being happy with yourself and your life. Yes, exactly. And I love that you have found your happiness in a tech space for the non-tech person. Yes, I absolutely. Feel the, I feel very similar to that. Um, so I, I really appreciate your valuable insight and your time and everything that you shared with everyone today. And if you have enjoyed this episode of Goddess of Crypto, please look Jessica Levesque up. Um, all of her information, including her uh, mental health advocacy site, will be in the show notes. Please like, share, comment, and tell all the women that you know about Goddess of Crypto so that they can get educated, so that they can start to feel comfortable and learn to surf the new energy of money before the tsunami knocks them over. We will see you next time for another episode. Thank you. Every week, transformational wealth coach Hallie Evelyn leads a conversation that helps to ensure that women everywhere can learn to surf the coming tsunami of the new energy of money. You can find her at goddessofcrypto.me 
That's goddessofcrypto.me. Be sure to subscribe to Goddess of Crypto on your favorite platform or watch the show on YouTube. And remember, wealth isn't just your privilege, it's your right. <laughs>